Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the inaugural CEFC Green Room webinar. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, we're going to talk this afternoon about decarbonisation in a post-pandemic world. So uh, uh, very exciting. We've only got 30 minutes, so we'll get uh, straight to it. I'll, I'll firstly, of course, acknowledge the traditional owners of uh, uh, of the uh, of uh, throughout Australia. Of course, people are joining us from uh, all around the countryside, uh, and um, I'd like to uh, acknowledge uh, those traditional owners um, and elders past, present and emerging. A few housekeeping items. Um, each of the frames on your screen, uh, the two frames can be expanded or minimised. Uh, you can ask questions in the Q&A box uh, and we're time permitting at the end, we will try and answer some of those uh, questions for you. We're also going to have a... Um, a questionnaire at the end of the webinar. It will appear, and we'll, we would appreciate if you've if you've got the time uh, to answer that and help us improve future events. So, um, as I say, the green room uh, today uh, is going to look at uh, Australia's clean energy transition, and um, we're going to bring uh, over the course of these series of webinars experts uh, to have robust and interesting conversations uh, around that particular topic. Uh, and we'll obviously, uh, given the CFC is, is hosting these webinars, we'll have a particular focus on the, the investment opportunities in this sector. So I'd like to welcome our first guest to the Green Room, Anna Scarbeck. Now, Anna, many of you will know, Anna is the CEO of Climate Works Australia, which is a, uh, a non-profit organisation founded in 2009, which uh, bridges the gap between research and climate action. And uh, throughout their work, they aim to catalyse action towards net zero emissions for Australia, Southeast Asia and the Pacific. Anna was, of course, one of the founding directors of the Clean Energy Finance Corporation and was recently named Australia's next mission innovation champion. Uh, so uh, welcome, Anna. Now, just before we, we start our, our Q&A chat, I, I want really to take the opportunity, if I could, give you a little bit of an update uh, with what the CEFC has been up to over the last uh, few months. Very kind of unusual, disruptive series uh, or period of time for uh, an investment house like ourselves. Um, but we have been very, very busy. We have been continuing to make investments right across the clean energy sector. And as we get very close towards our year end, we end 30 June, uh, we have made something like well, nearly a billion dollars worth of, of commitment. So uh, that's pretty exciting. We're pleased about that. Um, some of the deals that we have done more recently um, that I thought I would just mention uh, to, to the audience, because uh, I think you, know, you might find them uh, illustrative, of just how broadly we are, we are investing. Uh, earlier in the year, we put $60 million into a green mortgage program, which is being run by Bank Australia. Uh, so you would get a, a, a cheaper interest rate with your mortgage if you are able to demonstrate a uh, high, you know, high degree of energy efficiency or sustainability with your home. Uh, we also uh, had a first here in Australia, the first project financing in a grid scale battery, which was at Hornsdale. I think people are very familiar with the, the Tesla battery. Uh, this was its stage two, effectively, of that, of that power reserve there in South Australia, and it was done on a limited recourse, a $50 million limited recourse loan into that expansion. We, uh, we funded our second waste to energy uh, project there in WA, in East Rockingham, near Perth. A uh, very large project, some half a billion dollars of capital, of which we contributed something like fifty-seven and a half million by way of subordinated debt. And um, in the last couple of weeks, we've made two very interesting and I, I think quite innovative investments through our innovation fund. We have a two hundred million dollar clean tech fund, if you like, and um, two good examples of what the innovation fund is doing. Uh, very recently, we made a $3.5 million investment into the uh, EV charging company Jet Charge, uh, which will use that capital to expand its charging infrastructure. And we also, in fact, only and only announced today, made our first investment into a uh, biosequestration, which was a $1.7 million investment into a company called 
soil carbon company and they what uh, the work that they're do doing is uh, they're, they're developing a particular seed technology which uh, when used in agriculture can uh, improve drought resilience increase productivity and of course um, reduce carbon uh, in the atmosphere so it could kind of increase um, how much carbon is retained in the soil through this microbial treatment of seeds so very excited to have made that particular investment. Um, in terms of the impact of COVID in the CFC, uh, yep, look, I think we're all uh, suffering from some of the consequences of COVID. We, uh, you know, we're seeing we're seeing um, an increase in in. in I suppose there's an increase in, in risk uh, creeping into the investment community in the banks. However, uh, we're trying to help where we can fill the gaps uh, as we do. Uh, the renewable energy sector has been uh, somewhat impacted in, through the supply chain through COVID. It already had some issues to deal with around the grid. So, uh, you know, they have remained unchanged. Um, but I, I guess we're, we're also, um, you know, have some of the challenges in, in other parts of the economy, in, in the real estate sector, uh, infrastructure and so on, where we've made investments being impacted by COVID. So, look, there's certainly no question that um, uh, that COVID is I I impacting our business. However, uh, you know, we're in good shape and, um, you know, I think we're hoping that we can use our capital and our expertise in this sector to help the uh, help the economy recover. And we've been engaging with the National COVID Coordination Commission uh, to uh, to see what we might be able to do, particularly in the areas of energy and potentially manufacturing. The other uh, couple of quick things I would mention before we start chatting to Anna is uh, the technology roadmap, which of course is one of the government's big initiatives uh, as, a, as a means of how they can use technology to address emissions. Uh, we've been very actively uh, engaging with with the government on how how they shape or together how we how we shape that particular initiative, uh, and the other thing which I guess is connected to the tech roadmap is the recent direction by the government uh, to the CFC to invest up to three hundred million dollars in hydrogen, the emerging hydrogen sector through what's called our advancing hydrogen fund. So uh, we will talk a bit about that uh, with Anna. So, um, well, welcome, Anna. Uh, great to have you here on our uh, inaugural, inaugural webinar. Uh, one of the um, uh, interesting things that uh, Climate Works has come out with recently is, of course, your recent decarbonisation futures report, which I know looks uh, across the economy and how uh, how various sectors of the economy can be decarbonised so that we can get ourselves on a trajectory of to net zero as quickly as possible and therefore uh, help contribute to limiting uh, global warming to below two degrees, to below one and a half degrees. I wonder if you could tell us a bit about the report and its findings as a way of kicking off our conversation. Thanks, Ian, and hello. Hello to you and everyone. Um, I'll give a super quick summary of the decarbonisation futures research, which is available on the Climate Works Australia website if you need. Um, we updated whole of economy scenarios for Australia's domestic emissions, that's emissions inside Australia, uh, not export, uh, since the last time we did this work with CSIRO and ANU in 2014. And we found that we can still achieve net zero emissions by 2050 uh, in Australia, which is the um, uh, Paris Agreement goal for two degrees. We also studied a 1.5 degree scenario and found that technology plus carbon forestry can enable Australia to stay within a, a 1.5 degree pathway as well. We studied the technologies across electricity, buildings, transport, industry and agriculture and land. And what we found in looking at progress in the last five years is that technology has really closed the technical gap in each of those sectors so that a zero emissions pathway is now possible in all of those sectors. We found we, will, we do still need carbon forestry or other nature-based solutions and sequestration to ensure that we're actually at net zero by 2050. But what we found was that the residual emissions, if you like, the emissions that technology doesn't abate and require sequestration is much smaller now in the scenarios than in five years ago. 
And that's because the technology's ability to perform, if you like, in, in, in reducing emissions has accelerated in that time. But what we found is the uptake of that technology would need to accelerate much, much more for Australia to actually deliver these pathways. So that at the moment, the pace of the deployment of these technologies does not match their potential to eliminate the emissions in line with those Paris pathways. Most of the technologies are demonstrated and mature, but there are still some emerging, in particular for transport industry and ag sectors. That's where there's, there's more work in the emerging space, and we can talk about some of the different technologies uh, through the dialogue if that's helpful. Thanks, Anna. Um, and you know, I think that's right. The, rep the report looks at various stages of um, you know, the, the various stages of those technologies. Some are still are at the R&D phase, some are at the early stage of commercialisation and others probably, I guess, particularly in the electricity sector, things like um, grid-scale um, solar PV, household PV and wind are now well and truly funded and invested by the, the, the private sector. Um, do you think, I mean, do you have a view about what's kind of needed to, to drive uh, an increase in investment or, or, you know, to get those technologies to move along that particular um, spectrum or, or, or does it depend upon the, the particular technology in question? Both. We found that across the whole, we studied the drivers. We, we have these triangle pictures in the report of action by government, action by businesses and action by consumers. Um, and uh, the technology performance itself. And we found that all of those drivers need to be accelerated to their strong settings. So it, there isn't, at the moment, enough consumer choice, for example, to drive demand for these technologies in a way that would deliver their deployment in a widespread way. So decisions by business and government can accelerate that. That can be through policy, it can be through procurement commitments, and those buying commitments create demand for these technologies. That Governments can do that, businesses can do that, or it can also be done in partnership. And I know CFC's got some great experience with ARENA and partnering with the private sector on that. We found that even where the technologies are mature, electricity, buildings, transport, and, and in industry as well, demand management, energy efficiency, even electrification is, is already proven as a technology, but often the, the scale of deployment is not yet occurring at widespread or commercial levels. And that can include business models needing in innovation, or it can include, as I said, a commitment at the buying, at the, at the demand side, which policy could do, or consumers and businesses can do when they make commitments around their share of renewables or other share of other fuels with, with uh, dates and trajectories formally, you know, well, well signposted into the future. And I think that's what, um, you know, we'd like to think that <clears throat> ARENA and the CFC are trying to do in, in many cases with these technologies. Uh, you know, from, from our side, and I think as the listening audience knows, the CFC is really, um, you know, it's, it's trying to kind of fill that gap between something that's just about commercial and then between that and where the point where the private sector is happy uh, happily enough to, to take over and that's not always a very easy or clear um you know spectrum to to, to identify but but that's what where, where we we invest because we you know we, we've we're hoping that we will by doing that we'll move technologies along and we will also make an appropriate return arena of course uh have a chance to, to uh, as a grant maker, they have less, you know, they don't, they don't need to have their capital uh, return, but of course they're, they're driving a particular outcome. So I, I guess, um, you know, your, your report, it, it's Australian centric, so it would look at the leaders that are kind of currently in place, CFC, ARENA, we've got as well things like the Climate Solutions Fund, uh, you know, it's rebadged the Emissions Reduction Fund, um, these days now known as the Climate Solutions Fund, as another um, source of, 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 I guess, supporting those new sorts of technologies. And, um, you know, of course, you would have seen the King report recently. Do you think um, areas like sequestration 
um, as, as an important technology, and you talk about it in many cases, that area being the gap at the end that we're always going to have to fill. Do you think that uh, you know, the Climate Solutions Fund and, and, and other stimulus like that will be important to driving that? Yes, all of those uh, funds and programs that you mentioned are playing a really important role. And all the more so because, as you've highlighted, you're trying to be that space where it's almost commercial and, and, and together with the private sector, you can help get the deployment more widespread. And what we identified is that is exactly where a large majority of the technology solutions now sit in terms of they have been demonstrated. We know that they work technologically, but they're not yet being rolled out at scale. So clearly some support for the market to do that is really well timed right now. And all of those agencies and funds that you mentioned can do that and more. The, the King Review looked at some uh, small but important tweaks to help energy efficiency be more attractive, to allow it to be some of the funding to be front ended, to allow it to be easier for smaller scale transactions and easier for larger scale players, easier for fragmented sectors like um, household residential. Uh, where energy ratings and information can play an important role in, 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 and you've already mentioned you're supporting residential mortgages already. So there's innovation in the business model partnering that's, um, that, that we see a great potential for innovation to, for, for more work um, along the areas that you've already highlighted. And I think the other message is that every sector still needs accelerated deployment. So in the next decade, the technology has the ability to dramatically advance our emissions reduction performance, and that includes in electricity, which is often a sector that, that we've, you know, we've seen world-leading investment levels in Australia. And yet our research shows, and consistent with what AEMO finds, is that Australia's renewable share can and should be in the high 70s percent in 2030 for us to be aligned with Paris Agreement goals. And so that's obviously a big step up from today in a decade. Um, and all the other sectors, buildings, transport, industry and ag, have similarly really large step change opportunities, whether it's livestock management, soil sequestration, as you mentioned, um, or industry buildings and transport. So, um, indeed, I mean, I'm encouraged to hear you talk about investing across all of the sectors and trying to help bridge the gap of when it's almost commercial and help, um, help the private sector move it into mainstream deployment at scale. Um, yes, that's right. I mean, it's it, it's interesting because in in some cases there are you know, areas that we invest in that have very clear and defined business models, and particularly in the in the generation sector with you know, things like you know wind, solar, potentially things like pump storage. Um, you know, you, you can you can make an investment in a, in a particular project. It produces electricity, um, sold into the market, and then it can return the capital. Some of the some of the um, some of the business models that are evolving, and particularly around things like um, you know lithium ion battery storage, um, at this stage. You know, they're still supported in most of the larger scale transactions that we're seeing around the country. They're still being supported by, say, state governments or some grant funding, and we have played a role uh, in that. And we talked a little bit, I uh, uh, mentioned earlier that Hornsdale battery, which was a combination really of state government support, um, arena, the federal government through, uh, through ARENA and then ourselves as a lender. On the other side of our portfolio, you know, as you say, we're in, uh, you know, in property sector, um, infrastructure, transport, agriculture, and you know, in things like the property sector, there probably is a combination of um, it's got to make sense for a consumer to, to want to put solar on their roof or to, to invest in some kind of energy efficiency technology. At the same time, yes, if there's a regime, be it at a a council level, state level or federal level that is helping push that along, then we are, um, you know, we're going to see a greater uptake of th those particular technologies. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the technology roadmap, which um, people would be very aware of. Um, so the government has come out and, of course, have got a very, uh, you know, laser-like focus on ensuring that technology is, is a way that this country uh, looks to address emissions. And the first 
um, paper is, is out there for consultation. I think there's a, something like 140 technologies on the list. Um, some of them are quite, uh, relatively uh, well known to us and reasonably mature uh, technologies. And then they're taking us through to sort of things that are uh, technologies of tomorrow, particularly uh, with a focus on hydrogen. I noticed, Anna, that you, uh, you know, you mentioned or, or made a statement or something along the lines of it doesn't matter if a cat is black or white as long as it catches mice in relation to the technology roadmap. I wonder, maybe you could tell us a bit more about, uh, you know, what, what that really means and what your thoughts are on, on the tech roadmap. Thanks. Um, and, uh, and credit to my staff for helping come up with some interesting opening lines for discussions of technology. But what we're really referring to there is um, the technology roadmap is a, a platform that has a lot of potential for us to work with in terms of achieving Australia's emission reduction goals. Um, and what it does is identify, a, um, as you say, 140 technologies, largely consistent with what we've researched uh, in our decarbonisation futures scenarios for Australia. And there's a focus on understanding and aiming for economic stretch goals to help bring down the cost of those technologies. And what we've tried to highlight is that in parallel to an economic stretch goal sits a deployment stretch goal. That all the evidence we've seen so far in clean energy and, and other sectors is that cost performance improvement is correlated with deployment. And so our scenarios work looked at what scale of deployment aligns Australia's emissions with the Paris goals. And we have suggested that those deployment goals can help set the ambition for the economic goals for technologies. So, for example, when we look at transport, we look at electric cars, but there's also electric trucks, for example. And, and we show that Australia could, could achieve a deployment rate of up to around 60% of new trucks sold being electric, which would be about a quarter of the total fleet. And that by aiming for deployment goals such as that, and for cars, it would be perhaps higher, you know, maybe three quarters new cars, which is close to a third of the fleet. Setting those sorts of deployment goals helps then the raft of agencies that you discussed look at how can each player in the market, the governments, the businesses, set their procurement goals aimed at that level of deployment. And what we know is when deployment rises, cost falls. Yeah, no, that's that's absolutely the case. And I see we've only got five or six minutes to go. This is very, very quick. It's sort of almost over before it began. Uh, there are, there's a few questions coming through, and I, I, maybe I'll, uh, I'll I'll answer one of them and then and maybe pose one uh, to you. Um, there's a question uh, from the um, you know from the audience there. What signals? Are we hearing from investors and do we think investors will still focus on low emissions uh, or will that go on hold because of the downturn? Maybe I'll have, have, have a go at answering that and, and maybe interested in your thoughts as well, Anna. I mean, my view um, has been for, for a long time that there is a very considerable amount of capital out there that wants to invest in the uh, in, in the environmental theme. Um, and that's right from, I think, uh, you know, the high net worth retail end of the investment community right through to industry super funds and large scale capital. I think there's increasing pressure uh, from you know, younger people and members of super funds that they want to see their money doing good things. And I think they and the environment is absolutely primary uh, in that in that particular theme. Yes, COVID is has been uh, a distraction from um, you know, the issue of, of, of climate change, particularly out there in the media. And um, However, I don't personally think that um, it will... Uh, y yes, it's been a, a disruption in, in terms of the, the, uh, the pace of investment at the moment, but I don't see it at all changing that fundamental macro theme uh, that, that capital wants to invest in the clean energy sector. Um, do, you, do, you, do you sort of agree with that, Anna? Have you got any other thoughts? Yes. It, additionally, um, it, it's been observed already that uh, sustainability focused, in terms of equity investment, sustainability focused funds have proven more resilient in this COVID shock than the man, mainstream market. So ESG is outperforming at the moment from an equity perspective. 
But importantly, you're absolutely absolutely right. Um, but some of the largest institutions have declared that the climate goals are in no way uh, subordinated by this crisis. Um, and indeed, um, legal opinion and regul financial regulators um, even overnight have issued new scenarios that they will be stress testing portfolios. Uh, this is from the NGFS. Um, stress, stress testing portfolios against these scenarios of achieving two degrees um, it, it goals in an orderly or disorderly way. So certainly um, the obligation on investors to take into account long-term climate risk and opportunity remains very firmly on foot. There is obviously the risk of short-term distraction, um, and that's that 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 is that is definitely a risk. Uh, management time is is buffeted by this shock, but I think formally fiduciary duty is not. And the reality that the um, COVID crisis has not taken away the climate change impacts is is well understood by most investors and directors. Thank you for that. There was a question about how. Um the C, what the role the CFC might be playing in the post-COVID recovery, and uh, maybe I'll just briefly uh, reference that. And you know, as I say, we are you know, very, very conscious that the government wants to um, stimulate um, the economy and particularly uh, create employment opportunities. Uh, in the light of of the COVID pandemic, um, there are a number of. Uh, nation-building projects that the Prime Minister, of course, has referred to, in particular uh, Project Marin. It's the link between Tasmania and Victoria that's been much talked about that would unlock the battery of the nation in Tasmania and, and provide uh, clean energy across the uh, the Bass Strait in, into Victoria. And that, that's certainly uh, a project that, that the CFC is very interested in and continuing to engage in governments and um, the relevant players in Tasmania are on. And, uh, you know, that's just kind of one example. Uh, we are, of course, looking and continue to look right across the economy for other uh, investment opportunities that not only would deliver on our clean energy policy objective, but it may also help stimulate a, a post-COVID recovery. Uh, one last quick question, Anna, maybe something to finish on. How confident are you that we can get to net zero by 2050 was a, a question that was posed. Our evidence shows that technology means we can be confident. We, we, actually, already we can see how Australia can achieve net zero emissions using technologies that are already invented and visible to us and in use. The challenge is whether we will put them into use at the scale required. And that's a combination of how proactive can investors be, can governments be and consumers be. And the power of that is in our own hands. Thank you. Well, that's a that's a great note to finish on. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining. It was terrific to uh, to have a chat this afternoon with you, Anna. And uh, thank you. We uh, we look forward to uh, to the next green room. So, and thanks everyone for uh, joining us on this webinar. All the best. Thank you.